You ready, Steve? I am ready. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started on this. This is a deep look at LIGO. It's a follow-up from last month's What's Up by Kent Richardson about gravitational waves. The LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. There are two gravitational observatories, one in Hanford, Washington, and the other in Livingston, Louisiana. It's operated by the California Institute of Technology and MIT. It's funded in part by the National Science Foundation. Here we have a couple of pictures of the two sites. The Hanford site in the desert of the high desert of Washington on the right, and Livingston in a very heavily wooded area of Louisiana on the left, which by itself is going to be a problem. So what is LIGO detected? Basically, big things that are going bump in the night, the mergers of black holes and neutron stars, the gravitational waves. Like electromagnetic waves, they travel at the speed of light. Or as somebody just told me, electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of gravity. They distort the fabric of space-time. The amount of stretch or compression is very small, even for very large events. The current established theory of gravitational wave was published by Albert Einstein in his 1915 General Theory of Relativity. The late cause of the effect of the waves was so minute, he never believed that they would ever be measured. So gravitational waves would stretch or compress an object and compress or stretch an object at right angles, as demonstrated in this diagram. The detectors me measure gravitational waves by using an interferometer. This diagram is of a basic Nicholson interfer interferometer, and LIGO can be said is not basic in any way. The laser light is split into two arms by a beam splitter, a half reflective mirror at 45 degrees. The light then returns to the beam splitter. The wave nature of light highly coherent can cause interference pattern when they intersect. The photo detector down at the bottom, with a black dot right here, would detect any phase shifts. The normal state would be no light coming through, complete destructive interference. Let's talk about interference. It comes in two flavors, constructive interference where the laser light is amplified, the height of the waves is added. You can see that on the diagram at the bottom on the left. And destructive, where the laser light is reduced or subtract the height of the waves are subtracted from the other. Amplitude, the height of the waves are either added or subtracted. This is a demonstration of a constructive, destructive interference. Green waves are coming from the left. Blue waves are coming from the right, and the red wave is the interference pattern. You can see the interference pattern goes from very high to very low as the waves offset. So we'll talk about LIGO technology. Physical, it's four kilometer arms. That's about two and a half miles. It has active dampening and passive dampening. Also has the second largest height for high vacuum space. We'll discuss all of these shortly. An optical system of mirrors, a laser system, and quantum squeezer. And then data handling, storage, and processing. The LIGO versus advanced LIGO. LIGO ran from 2002 to 2010. 
with no detections of the gravity, gravitational waves. A LIGO, the advanced LIGO, started up in 2015. And within days of startup, it did its first detection of a gravitational wave. So we have some of the differences between LIGO and A LIGO. The mirror is 40 kilograms versus 11. That's 40 kilograms, about 88 pounds. Suspension is a single pendulum versus a quadruple pendulum, end to end. Suspension was metal wires, now is glass fibers. Sounds precarious to me. The advanced LIGO has added active seismic isolation. And the advanced LIGO is quantum squeezing. So here's a more advanced diagram of LIGO. You can see there are just two mirrors. There are four mirrors, two in each arm. And there's a fabric Perot cavity in each one. Describe that in a second. Again, you have the photo detector at the bottom. Oops, sorry. A beam splitter, a laser off to the left. And for those of you who really like Lego, you know who you are, they have a Lego Lego. So the physical site. I heard a couple of chuckles. Four kilometer arms at right angles, the Fabray Perot cavity in each arm to bounce a beam back and forth 280 times approximately, effectively lengthening the arms to 1,200 kilometers. It takes 40 days to remove all the air to achieve the ultra high vacuum. Really, the Large Hadron Collider is a larger high vacuum. It also uses a continuously running ion pump to suck out any stray particles of air or stray atoms just roaming around in the vacuum. Arms are long enough to notice the curvature of the Earth. It's fixed at one end. It's going to sit up above the ground about a meter on the other end. You have dampening, you have active dampening through electronics. The seismic sensors measure vibrations, which adjust electromagnets to offset the movement. Think of noise canceling headphones. You have passive dampening through the four pendulums, which are end to end, and a 40 kilogram mirror held up by 0.4 millimeter glass fibers, about the size of them. Mechanical pencil. Here's a diagram of passive dampening. See the four, oops, the four pendulums. This is the first, second, third, and the fourth pendulum. The mirror is called the test mass. That's, that's what they're using to test. Optics. Mirrors are ultra pure, ultra pure fused silica polished in nanometer perfection with many, many coatings, make them very reflective. It has a 200 watt infrared laser. So it starts off as a 4 watt C laser through two levels of amplification. It has feedback tuning of the laser to achieve a 100 million reduction. In the variability of frequency and power. It uses quantum squeezing to improve the signal to noise. And this has been since the third observing room. Talk a little bit about quantum squeezing. If you read the president's corner from November of last year, a new watch magazine, you would have heard about, read about quantum school. It's where quantum mechanics, the physics are very, very, very small, come into play. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that in the case of laser light, one cannot accurately measure both the amplitude, the volume, and the phase. 
the distance between the peaks of the light. You measure the amplitude accurately, the phase will be more inaccurate and vice versa. But of course, LIGO needs to be able to measure very accurately the phase of the light. Otherwise, the interference patterns we saw in the diagrams will not indicate a change in the distance between the mirrors. And remember, we're measuring a distance smaller than an atom, smaller than the size of a proton. This, the solution is to squeeze the light to have very accurate phase information. So will cause the amplitude to be come noisier, but very accurate phase information. And that's demonstrated in the middle diagram. You see the phase, the amp peaks are very sharp, but the amplitude, the height is a little bit higher. And this is done using a crystal with nonlinear optical properties, which will squeeze the light to make the phase more accurate at the expense of the amplitude. The data handling. Terabytes of data created daily when operating. The equivalent of 178,000 DVDs per year of operation. Data processing from 35 MSUs, million service units, going to 400 MSUs. Now, MSU is an old IBM metric. One MSU is roughly equal to 6 million mainframe instructions per second. So multiply by 6. Other gravitational wave detectors. We have Virgo in service since 2007, Advanced Virgo since 2016. Laser arms are three kilometers apart. Here, Pisa, Italy. Kamioka, gravitational wave detector. Laser arms are three kilometers. In uh, Kamioka, Japan, since startup testing since 2020, it's had some technical issues. What? An old mine. And now we have Indigo, the Indian Initiative in Gravitational Wave Observations. It's in commissioning, in design and commissioning, expected to be commissioned in 2023. Other observatories look for astronomical objects or events. LIGO listens for them. So the first detection, September 14th, 2015, the merger of black holes of 36 and 29 solar masses. Solar masses, of course, this sun, this mass of our sun. Listen very carefully. And we have the second detection ever made shortly thereafter, December 26, 2015, the merger of black holes of 14 and 8 solar masses. It's a little harder to do. And finally, my favorite, the detection of two neutron stars, August 17th, resulting in a 2.7 solar mass black hole. So the gravitational waves that both LIGO and Virgo have detected. What you have in the blue are black hole mergers. Down at the bottom, you have the neutron star mergers. So I've done a couple of those. And you'll see it here, for instance, this black hole of just slightly less than 80 solar masses. And this one of slightly more than 80 solar masses merge to something a little less than 160 solar masses. It's ginormous. And keep in mind that when you see those two dots, they won't add up to the final dot. The difference being the energy kicked off in gravitational waves. 
There you have it. Questions. Anybody have questions? Somebody, I think, is asking if you could. I didn't hear of them either. I'm not sure what you can do about the audio, Steve, for the black hole. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. But, can, but you can find those online, though, right? You can. I have that turned up all as, as high as it will go. Yeah. You did not hear this one? No. I haven't heard any of them. I don't well, know. that's too bad. Yeah. Well, I should have tested that. I actually tried that on um, Microsoft Teams and it worked fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Sorry. Not sure why. But anyway, um, like like these these are publicly available. So you should. Yes, of course. So, you should, of course. so people shouldn't have any trouble logging on to. To do that. No questions. I'll stop sharing. Any questions? Thank you, Steve. That was like you like to say it was kind of like part two, if you will, from our one of our earlier ones. Well, somebody said I heard them. Hmm? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, question says, can they triangulate where they were coming from? Yes. Sort of. Yeah. The answer is sort of. Yeah. You have three detectors that would give you a rough idea of where they may be, general idea of the area of the sky that they were coming from. Right. They have a better idea of the masses of the black holes or neutron stars. Yeah. In the in the neutron star merges, because neutron stars when they do merge will give off some fireworks that they've actually seen with other optical or right other kinds of observatories. That's right. Okay. Anything else? Some other people heard them too. Uh, I don't see anybody with any more questions. I have somebody ask what quantum squeezing. And uh -huh. Again, it is just a property of quantum mechanics that if you measure something, then something else has to be less accurately measured right. and in this case what you want to do is you want the peaks of the waves to be very sharp you don't care how loud the waves are mm -hmm. you want the peaks to be very sharp and that's what quantum squeezing does mm -hmm. the setup for the quantum squeezing was look like a physics lab so i have no idea what they were doing mirrors all over the place Probably he goes in there. Any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to wait. Well, I don't see anybody asking any more. Once again, thank you, Steve. Sure. And I'll put a plug in for anybody else who wants to give a what's up. Very this good. isn't so hard. Yeah. We'll be glad to help. That's right. Yeah. Talk to Ken. <laughs> But yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of information out there that that would be nice to have uh, people talk about, you know. So, um, or something that's of interest to anyone. So, okay, well, I could put my two cents in worth. Oh, well, sure. two cents worth in. I mean, uh, in in a lot of ways, it's easier to do it via Zoom than standing up in front of the. You know, 50, 60 people at the uh, Lindsay. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. 
Okay, well, um, I think you're probably ready to go, aren't you, uh, Jeff? Yes, I am. At okay, your, good. All your right. Discretion. Well, I think uh, without any further ado, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, um, let's go ahead and uh, go for our main event. So again, uh, if you got questions, do just what we did here with the uh, uh, what's up and go ahead and put it in the chat. If you want to direct it specifically to the presenter, that's fine. Otherwise, you could just leave it for everyone because everyone gets to see the question. And if they well, I'm probably not likely to read chat while I'm giving my presentation. So I either hold your questions after my talk or if you want to interrupt the talk, that's also fine. I'll be happy to answer a question on the fly. Okay, yeah, well, like I said, sometimes it's easier to do it at the end. Sometimes it's uh, uh, as you catch them, that's fine. Uh, it's less chaotic to do it at the end, but there's something that's really pressing that I'm not gonna be hard and fast about it. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, so anyway, so I've been talking to Dr. Jeffrey Moore here, and of course, let me introduce him. Um, Dr. Moore is a research scientist at NASA Ames. Uh, he's the imaging team lead for NASA's New Horizon mission to the Jupiter system, the Pluto system, and the Kuiper Belt. Uh, in addition to the New Horizons mission, Dr. Moore provides leadership and participation on other NASA planetary mission science teams, including the Europa Clipper mission, many of the Mars missions, and research on the icy Galilean satellites. Uh, Dr. Moore was awarded the 2018 G.K. Gilbert Award for his outstanding contributions to the field of planetary geology and was recently awarded the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. He's also a Geological Society American Fellow. So this evening's presentation is entitled The Ocean World of Europa and NASA's Clipper Mission, Exploring a Potential Habitable World. I'm pleased to introduce, finally, Dr. Moore. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Um, let me see, I'm going to click to share a screen, and then next I'll try to go to presentation mode. And you can all tell me if you're seeing what you want to see. I'm going to... We haven't got you yet, Jeff. Uh, there we go. But I think you're muted. Yeah, you muted yourself, Jeff, accidentally. There we go. Yeah, that was a strange mm -hmm. thing. OK, I'm back. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. So as you can see, the title is The Ocean World of Europa and NASA's Europa Clipper Mission, Exploring a Potentially Habitable World. Uh, let's go to the first actual slide. Uh, let's see if I can make that happen. Um, hmm. It's not good. Why am I slide? There we go. Whatever makes it work. Huh. Okay, well, as you know, uh, Europa is one of the four Galilean satellites. They're all large objects. Um, you know, the Earth's moon, for instance, falls uh, between the size of Io and Europa. Ganymede is the largest uh, satellite in the solar system. It's larger than the planet Mercury. Callisto is almost the same size, and for that matter, so is uh, Saturn's moon Titan. So on with the show. So Europa's surface. Let's talk about that. Now, by the way, I'm a geologist, as you probably gathered from my introduction. So I can speak with a little bit of authority about surface processes, and I'll be vaguer about things such as, as magnetic fields and um, and fuels and particles and, and mass spectrometers and things of that nature. So basically, uh, Europa's surface is, has kind of four major landform types that uh, sort of stand out as categories. Uh, there's the pervasive ridged plains, which the surface is dominated by. There are patches of surface that are broken up to form so-called chaos. There are a few impact craters, although not very many. And based upon our uh, um, calculated flux rate of impacts uh, on Europa, we've determined from the number of craters we see that the average age of the surface of Europa is only about 50 million years old, with some places probably very young. Um, and then last but not least are the so-called lectin uh, 
reticuli, which we uh, used to call uh, spots, domes, and, uh, and moats. And we'll talk a bit about them here in a moment too. Okay, uh, the interior of Europa is heated by tidal heating. And we just heard a uh, discussion of uh, flexion of uh, uh, dilation and compression uh, in the previous talk. And because of the resonances of the Galilean satellites, um, Europa's orbit uh, is elliptical, uh, but of course it's buried very deeply into um, Jupiter's magnetic field. And so this elliptical orbit uh, forces these body tides uh, in Europa, which in turn heats the interior and keeps its thin H2O layer thin. It's about, we think maybe on order of a 100 kilometers or so thick um, liquid beneath an ice crust, which we estimate is something on order of between 10 and 20 uh, kilometers thick. So one could think of it as a um, as an ocean world with a pole to pole uh, ice cap. Um, and another way to think about the amount of liquid water on the surface of Europa is that there's more liquid water on the surface of Europa than there is um, on the surface of the Earth. And last but not least, because Europa has only a, a sixth of the surface gravity as um, the Earth, that means that the um, pressures at the bottom of Europa's ocean are comparable with the uh, pressures at the bottom of the, uh, the deepest parts of the Earth's oceans. Okay, now it also, because it has this liquid layer, it induces a magnetic field. Uh, and we just had a bit of a discussion earlier about how, um, well, well, and most of you know this from general uh, electromagnetics, that, um, that a magnetic field passing through a conductor in turn generates uh, uh, this so-called induced field. And it's from this induced field that we first discovered unambiguously that there was liquid ocean underneath the ice crust. Uh, and we have instruments aboard Europa Clipper, which will help us uh, better define um, the nature of that ocean, both its uh, thickness uh, and its salinity. And there are some pictures of colleagues who are the founders, including Margie Kibbelson, who's the woman in the foreground, who um, was the lead scientist who made that discovery using uh, Galileo observations uh, 20 years ago. Oh, and this diagram shows that uh, by measuring such things as uh, fuel strength and so on, uh, we'll hope we'll be able to identify the uh, uh, ocean's depth uh, and its conductivity with the instruments which will fly aboard Europa Clipper. Okay, let's talk about ridges. This is kind of a, a neat film. This, or, or uh, I should say, um, pan and zoom. Uh, this is made using uh, Galileo data collected back in uh, the late 1990s. Uh, to give you a sense of, of size, the width of the uh, ridge is about two or three kilometers. And the highest resolution images here are about 20 meters per pixel. And as you can see, as we go along here, they're just coming up in the field of view. I'll try to put my cursor on it. You can see uh, large blocks which have rolled off, as well as other material that has rolled. And you can see the newest and largest of these ridges obviously are the youngest because they sit on top of, or else to use a geological expression, they cross cut pre existing topography. Uh, and uh, we think they are in part some of the things which are formed by the geological processes created by the flexure of the ice crust by the tidal torque. Okay, uh, let me see, can I get my next? There we go. Uh, our next slide shows uh, large bands, which are much, much wider than the ridges. In fact, if you look carefully in the picture on the left, you can see a uh, ridge that's the same dimensions as the ridge we just saw in the previous image. And I'll remind you that it was about two kilometers across. So these, these broader kind of intermediate albedo bands are more like tens, tens of kilometers across and hundreds of kilometers long. And we think they are basically formed not really very different than the way mid-oceanic ridges on the earth are formed. And here, let me show you a model of how that process might work. Okay, uh, and, and just in, in the same sense, we have uh, the analogs of uh, spreading ridges. We also have subsumption sub zones, which are like subduction zones where uh, old, uh, colder, uh, denser um, 
ice crust of Europa is pushed under uh, itself. Uh, and much in the same way we get uh, a, a volcanism as these um, cold layers are shoved under uh, each other, we get so-called cryolavas. Um, Someone analogous to how you get uh, the um, get mountain uh, ranges behind subduction zones on the Earth, such as, for instance, the Cascades. And let me see if you have an illustration of how that works. I think so. Oh, no, this just shows you where those subduction zones are. So I think I can go back and forth. So maybe this will give you some sense of, of uh, how we think the, the temperature profiles of these things work as well. Okay, as I said before, we have impact structures. Uh, and you can see the smallest ones like Gavana, which are less than uh, 10 kilometers across, form craters which don't look very different than the craters we see uh, elsewhere in the solar system. But very quickly, when you get into uh, impact craters, which are impact features, I can start calling it now, so they don't often form craters anymore, that are on the order of 20 kilometers or so across, they very rapidly become very shallow and almost unrecognizable. The, uh, that uh, raid crater you saw uh, on the disk of uh, Europa a few slides ago, this is Quill. And Quill is the one we can see in the upper left-hand corner. In reality, it has you know, um, a very, very shallow uh, depth that barely qualifies in the um, topographic sense as a crater. And uh, a nearly similar sized uh, impact crater called Menomen, which is below Quill in this picture on the lower left, um, basically just looks like a funny um, disturbance in the ice. Uh, and it probably also tells us something about uh, the thickness of the ice at the time of its formation, uh, implying that as I say, it could be very shallow. Then last but not least, there's a couple of so-called multi-ring impact features, Tyre and Kalanish. Uh, and you can clearly see they simply form a series of concentric rings. Now we've seen similar features like these on Ganymede and Callisto, except the uh, multi-ring uh, features on Ganymede Callisto are typically 10 times larger than uh, on the onset of their appearance than the features on uh, uh, Europa. Once again, strongly implying that uh, these larger impact events simply broke all the way through the ice and uh, uh, formed uh, these uh, exotic uh, um, uh, impact features. And of course, uh, as you'll hear me say, we're going to, amongst other things, fly a ground penetrating radar system on Europa Clipper, which we hope to discern in detail the actual subsurface structure and the ice crust that these things have formed in. Okay, uh, composition. Uh, there is dark stuff on Europa, and there's been a number of studies done over the years to try to determine what they are. It seems there's a lot of hydrated salts particularly salts, either uh, magnesium salt or more classically like table salt, sodium salt. There also seems to be evidence for um, powders which are derived from the desiccation of sulfuric acid as well as just out and out sulfur. Now, some of the sulfur could be implanted from uh, the sulfur clouds that are, is emitted by, um, uh, by Io. But at the same time, we also must wonder if not, if there is not indeed substantial magnesium salt or um, um, and that's the magnesium sulfide salt uh, in, the, in, the, in the ocean of, of Europa. We hope we'll find that out by analyzing um, hopefully fresh patches of this material where it's erupted on the surface and desiccated with Europa Clipper. Now, uh, before I mention the so-called uh, lectinulae uh, feature, features, they um, form, as I say, spots and domes. Um, and we believe that strongly indicates that the lower four-fifths of the ice crust or ice layer, the ice pack on the uh, 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 on Europa is in fact uh, convecting and ductile. And so basically blobs of warm material, less dense warm material rise up uh, much the same fashion that, uh, that the premise or the basis of a lava lamp. And I believe this model shows how that works here. Oops, nope, as long as I that, I thought I had a, that was an animated model, but I guess it isn't. Okay, so let's go on to chaos. Now, um, chaos is, as we just 
talked about is very interesting. It basically is pre-existing service has been broken up into large chunks, often rotated and tilted and foundering, like as you can see in the image on the left. Um, we've noticed that uh, typically the overall topography of chaos comes in two forms. There is chaos, which seems to be a, a blister. It's like a blister of chaos on the surface. And then there seems to be chaos uh, which is basically lying uh, in kind of a slightly shallow depression. And we think that's telling us which of these chaos still have liquid layers underneath them and which ones don't, because we think that once the subsurface water chamber in which the chaos is formed over freezes solid, of course, and it goes freeze expansion, as you know, ice expands when it freezes. And that's what causes the um, older chaos to basically have a overall blistered-like or dom domical or plateau-like um, uh, general topography. But the chaos which exists uh, in a kind of a surface which is otherwise, you know, broadly speaking, level, except of course it has chunks of stuff floating in it, uh, and it's at a lower level, uh, probably represents uh, chaos which is still currently has a liquid uh, substrate beneath it. And we think that some of those substrates could only be a few thousand years old, so clearly, Europa Clipper, we're going to look very closely at these, I uh, believe, are much younger and current chaos forming regions to see if they don't also have material extruded to the surface that we could examine uh, more closely to de determine its chemical composition and other parameters and hopefully identify a potential landing site for a future Europa lander, which we will hope to fly after the uh, Europa Clipper mission, uh, going to a target which the Europa Clipper itself identifies. And as you probably have heard, there is uh, some evidence for active plumes uh, at, near the South Polar region of, um, of Europa. I, um, I don't think that I can honestly say they've been uh, unambiguously verified. However, we've seen now several uh, uh, occasions in which there was um, evidence that these features might be there. They're near the signal to noise uh, limit, but uh, it's intriguing enough to um, make sure we'll have the ability to measure them and characterize the materials in them. Should we, should they exist and should we be lucky enough to have one erupt while our spacecraft is, is uh, near, near Europa itself. Okay, so obviously what drives this whole mission is our interest in the ingredients for life. First and foremost, of course, is water. You need to have uh, 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 both uh, liquid, and t uh, liquid ocean, which we think we have, uh, we also need to have possible lakes within the ice shell and maybe ones that have local melting and extrusion on the surface. And of course we need chemistry. We need like as the, as the cartoon uh, on the uh, right illustrates that we have hopefully uh, hydrothermal vents on the, uh, on the ocean floor, which in turn uh, dumps a, a, a mixture of chemicals uh, into the ocean. And that these chemicals are in chemical disequilibrium. Uh, and th this chemical disequilibrium in uh, combination with other uh, chemistry, which is brought to the uh, surface from above, mainly through radiation and so on, and, and slowly transmitted into the ice crust to the, uh, the base, that this chemical gradient will in turn be sufficient to drive metabolism. So you have to have chemistry, uh, energy, and, and of course, water, the universal solvent to see if these things are, uh, this region actually ha has uh, living organisms uh, in it. And of course, we think it's extremely unlikely that Europa could ever have gotten terrestrial organisms uh, transported to its surface via meteorites, such as people have suggested might be a means to get meteorites, uh, um, ter um, terrestrial organisms to Mars or Martian organisms to the Earth. So should we find life on Europa, we think it will truly be the life of a, life forms of a second genesis that formed entirely independently and separately from uh, life on Earth, which of course, it makes it of the very highest scientific interest to, uh, to everybody. <laughs> Okay, so uh, as you can guess, our scientific objectives are to understand the ice shell and ocean, um, which involves you know, understanding the, the shell, the subsurface water, which might occur uh, in it, the heterogeneity, the ocean properties, et cetera. We're interested in the composition for reasons which are obvious from the previous slide I just outlined. And then the geology, which allows us to understand how the surface is formed, the, sur the surface features, including, of course, very importantly, sites of recent or current activity. Uh, and areas of other high science interest localities, again, with the intent of 
sending a spacecraft down to the surface, uh, maybe within a decade or so afterwards, to really examine these materials uh, in great detail and see if we can't find uh, unambiguous evidence of, uh, of life um, uh, living in the ocean, uh, within the ocean. Okay, we have a number of instruments and these are sort of arranged in this diagram with the ones which are kind of fuels and particles type instruments listed uh, above the, the surface, such things as the mass spectrometer, a, a dust analyzer, a magnetometer, uh, and the PIMS, which is Faraday cups. Um, and then at the surface, we'll examine the surface with a, a ultraviolet spectrometer, uh, uh, both a narrow angle and wide angle uh, multicolor cameras, which will do the uh, lion's share of the geological characterization. MICE is the uh, imaging IR spectrometer. Uh, Ethemus is a thermal imager, uh, which will look in the mid IR, which will both help us uh, characterize the surface from its uh, thermal physical properties, how the blocks of ice warm up and cool off during the day, as well as if there are any local uh, uh, sources of heat emitting underneath the ice crust, we'll be able to detect those directly. And then uh, Reason, which is the uh, instrument I'm most closely associated with, which is the ice penetrating radar, which we will use to uh, understand uh, the underlying geological structure beneath these geological features, as well as hopefully detect transitions between the brittle and ductile layers of the, of the uh, ice crust. And depending upon uh, the actual physical properties of the ice crust, we might be able to see all the way through to the uh, water ice interface. Okay, uh, Europa Clipper uh, is not gonna actually orbit Europa proper, but in fact will orbit um, Jupiter rather than the same way that Juno does, but it's designed to make many dozens of close flybys um, of Europa. It will do some flybys of some of the other Galilean satellites, but it's mostly simply to change the orbit by using Ganymede and Callisto uh, as um, gravity assist objects. Now, clearly as we fly by them, we'll turn on the instruments and look at them as well. But but the principal, obviously, principal target of Europa Clipper is gonna be by definition Europa. And here you can kind of see a configuration of the spacecraft as it's currently being assembled. And you can see there are a series of uh, antennas sticking out the perpendicular to the solar panels. And by the way, this is another solar powered uh, mission. The um, uh, capacity of, of solar panels to collect uh, and generate useful amounts of electricity even at 5 AU, which gets 1 25th as much uh, solar energy as the Earth does, has reached a point and we can also make them radiation hardened enough that we don't have to use thermal uh, electric generators any longer to uh, um, support missions, uh, at least orbital emissions uh, uh, in Jupiter space. Uh, so as you can see, the, uh, the things which don't or aren't all uh, stuck on their remote sensing deck, which are all the nadir point instruments like the cameras and the spectrometers and so on. Uh, there is a, a boom for the magnetometer. And then there, of course, as I say, there are the two different types of antenna, which the uh, uh, ground penetrating radar systems use because we're going to look at the uh, surface in two different wavelengths, in part to uh, resolve ambiguity caused by interference generated by uh, Jupiter itself in those wavelengths as well as it allows us to uh, probe uh, uh, different size structures within the ice crust. Okay, this is kind of a cool cartoon. This shows a, um, a graphic of one of the uh, orbital tours which we have considered. We uh, obviously are having the people who put these things together uh, consider a number of options and then get we, the team, get together to evaluate which of these various tours most closely uh, um, you know, answer all the um, questions we have and do the best job of interrogating the, interrogating the largest uh, range of surface types and surface features. Uh, and um, as you can see, one of the interesting characteristics of, um, of the flybys we have for uh, Europa for Europa Clipper is that they unfortunately don't fly very close to the leading and trailing hemispheres, which is of course exactly opposite of the experience we had with um, Galileo back in um, the late 1990s and early part of the present century, where we did a number of flybys at the leading and trailing hemispheres. Uh, and for instance, the, uh, the chaotic train I showed you earlier was uh, was flown by, but you can see it rotating under the surface. It's, it's in fact almost at the uh, 
upper center of the disc as we speak there, um, which is unfortunately being uh, avoided by, uh, by the, this particular uh, 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 tour design, which is being considered. And we think we are able to have a uh, extended mission and I anticipate we will have an extended mission. Uh, we can probably design some flybys so that we can uh, uh, examine these so-called avoidance zones at the leading and trailing hemispheres. Okay. Now, I don't know how easy this uh, uh, figure is to interpret, except it simply shows the various fields of view of various instruments. The, the, the very vague gray field you see, um, which is the widest field of view, uh, represents um, kind of the effective information being transmitted back to, from the surface, uh, from the uh, ground penetrating radar, and then the bluish gray, more uh, distinctive um, field of view is the wide angle camera uh, of the system. And then the smaller fields of view you can see, and you can see from the uh, uh, little key in the lower left, are the fields of views of the narrow angle camera, which by the way, you can see things smaller than a meter, meter per pixel, as well as the fields of views of the uh, uh, near IR spectrometer, the UV spectrometer, uh, and the um, thermal infrared spectrometer. Okay, uh, these slides are slightly old. In the last couple of months since they were made, we have a commitment from NASA on the type of, of um, launch vehicle capability, although they won't actually tell us what kind of launch vehicle it's gonna be, although one has to imagine a primary candidate would be a, um, a SpaceX uh, uh, Heavy, uh, which will give us a mission uh, profile similar to the one on the right called MIGA, which I tell people is, stands for Make Europa Great Again. Um, that uh, uh, will have a flyby first of the Earth and then, well, I'm sorry, first a flyby of, of Mars is where the M and MIGA comes from. Uh, and the trajectory uh, change caused by gravity assist will take it back to the Earth where the second uh, pass of the Earth will give it enough uh, um, velocity to get out to uh, uh, Jupiter orbit insertion uh, in uh, April of uh, 2030. And we're in the middle of making hardware. Obviously, we're going to launch this spacecraft in just three years. We're, we, he'll be glad to know we're busily putting uh, uh, machining pieces, uh, um, putting the spacecraft together. You can see the high gain antenna reflector uh, there on the left. Uh, here they're uh, milling the uh, machining, the, um, the Nader deck, which is the uh, piece of hardware that, amongst other things, the, the um, observation. Uh, platform will be mounted to, and then you can see the, the upper propulsion module, uh, which will carry our, uh, our fuel to uh, get ourselves both into um, uh, orbit around uh, Jupiter, as well as do all the necessary orbit trim maneuvers that we'll need to make sure we uh, keep up the encounters that we, uh, that we are planning with whatever final uh, tour design that we, we settle on. Uh, here are some various uh, the instrument hardware. I think probably the one I find most interesting or entertaining in this picture is the um, infrared spectrometer's principal lens is a calcium fluoride lens, which as you know, would probably promptly um, hydrate and turn foggy in the, um, in the Earth's atmosphere. So of course it has to be kept in a perfect vacuum, but uh, CAF2 is one of the few materials which is completely transparent to the range of wavelengths that uh, the IR spectrometer will uh, use. Um, let me see what else. Um, at the second from the left on the bottom is um, the narrow angle camera um, model, engineering model for the imaging system. And it's one of the few things which actually has a major moving part in that it has a gimbal, which allows the uh, camera to swing forward and back uh, about 30 degrees, which allows it both to track the surface as it's whizzing beneath it, as well as take a number of images uh, um, along a line of flight, uh, which uh, otherwise you would not be able to do, or merely bolted the spacecraft and simply looking nader. So that was a bit of innovation. It's not quite the same as having a scan platform, which has usually two or even three degrees of, of uh, motion, free, uh, 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 degrees of freedom. But at least it has one, which will, we think, vastly enhance the imaging capability uh, and science return to the neural angle camera. Uh, and then uh, on the lower left, you can see the various types of, of uh, antennae which we are developing, which, which can be uh, have a fail-safe deployment capability uh, 
once they're mounted onto the uh, solar panels. Okay, here is uh, the science team, uh, along with some of the engineers. Uh, and you can see that um, we have a field, a group of people who are not quite as many people as say are on uh, Perseverance, for instance, but they're not, it's not a tiny group either. We have probably on order of like 150 people that make up the core um, science and engineering group. Uh, and we, uh, back before COVID, got together for meetings, although we've had our last two meetings, obviously, uh, remotely. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, it's a, a, uh, we have lots of uh, uh, people who do a lot of different things. Uh, I won't bore you with the uh, eye chart above it. I, I think this is being recorded. So um, you, if you wish, go back and read who does what uh, at your, uh, your leisure. Um, okay, I think there you can go to our website to learn more about the um, about the, the mission, uh, easy to remember, europa.nasa.gov. Uh, there's our, uh, our logo. Uh, and I think that's it. Um, I have a backup slides, which are just kind of fun to look at, but, um, and maybe I should run those while we, uh, while we uh, go to question and answer. Uh, so uh, yeah, here's a, a journey to uh, more uh, Galileo data, which has been, um, uh, merged cleverly to uh, to give you kind of a nice uh, uh, you know zoom and pan of uh, features on uh, Europa. So while that's playing, I'll open the floor to questions. Hi there, it's Matt Ridgeway. I've got a question for you. Um, hey, pardon me if you said this in your speech because my computer crashed on me, so I missed about five minutes. Um, but once the uh, orbiter is in orbit around Jupiter, and I think there's like 40 something orbits, how long is that part of the mission going to last? And then what's going to happen to the orbiter after that part, the main part of the mission? Okay, well, we'll have, I think a few more than 40 uh, flybys of Europa in the primary mission by the time we get the primary mission fully designed. But we anticipate that will, uh, once we actually get into the mapping orbits, last up order of two years, two and a half years, something like that. And we are fully planning to make sure we have enough uh, propellant on board the spacecraft uh, to hopefully have at least one more, maybe two more extended missions. So I can easily imagine before the end of the mission, it's entirely over of having something in order of 100 or 140 or something uh, flybys of a uh, Europa, I mean, for instance, you can well imagine that if we find some areas that are of very high science interest, you know, like green streaks on the ground or something like that, we'll want to have uh, several flybys, both to confirm our as best uh, data as we can possibly get on that those sites, as well as, of course, view at different geometries uh, to build up a, a high quality topographic and uh, imaging database so that we can use uh, use those sites as potential landing sites so that the, we can make sure that the landers can get into them and land them at the same degree of fidelity and reliability that um, the last two uh, Mars rovers were able to land within you know, a few hundred meters of their intended target and with uh, complete safety. Um, is that your question? Uh, it it does. So you're you're building some uh, some room in there to extend the mission, uh, but uh, oh, we're not going to scrap it once once it's all over. Yeah, uh, it'll be disposed of, and we'll probably either crash it into um, Io or uh, Callisto. Okay. Or perhaps Jupiter itself, although that requires more fuel. Probably Io is the best bet. One doesn't think that Io is likely to be a place that you can. can quote, contaminate and somehow confuse anything that might have been brought to the earth and any life forms that might possibly live on uh, Io. I mean, the only kind of life forms you can imagine that might live on Io would be like the Horta from the old Star Trek series or something, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm going to... Um... If I can stop sharing, so we can just look at. Okay, more questions. I have a few in chat. Okay, I'll I'll answer questions in chat. As somebody will read them. 
Back those who wrote the chat questions, just feel free to unmute yourselves and ask your question. Okay, I'll I'll go first. Uh, change the subject a little bit, but why does Saturn's moon Titan have an atmosphere, while the other outer moons do not? Ha! Ah, uh, a good question. And my dear friend uh, Kevin Zonley wrote probably the seminal study on that back in the nineteen nineties, which was entitled "A um, Hundred Titans." And it turns out it's a combination of luck and place. Um, it turns out that you can imagine a, a combination of impact sizes uh, and timings uh, and flux rates, which would completely blast the atmosphere off of um, uh, Titan. And by extension, had uh, Ganymede Callisto once have had uh, atmospheres, which they very well could have when they were in a primordial state. Uh, but because uh, uh, Ganymede and Callisto are, you know, half the distance from the sun as uh, the S Saturn system is, so therefore it's four times as much uh, solar energy, which means the ability for the atmosphere to be stripped is four times greater. And also mm -hmm. the uh, impact velocities of, uh, of uh, heliocentric objects striking the uh, uh, Galilean satellites is several times the velocity of, of uh, similar sized objects striking uh, Titan. The uh, hotter environment from in the proximity to the sun in combination with uh, the higher velocity in which uh, objects could strike um, uh, objects in the Jupiter system. And of course, Jupiter itself is close to the asteroid belt. Now, who knows what the dating mm -hmm. of the asteroid belt is vis-a-vis -vis when these events want to take place on um, Jupiter. But you could imagine there might be a lot more material available to collide with um, the primordial uh, Ganymede and Callisto all those things combined statistically to make them much more likely not to have an atmosphere. Uh, and then um, uh, Titan may have lucked out by having an atmosphere. But then of course, there's all these issues of, um, of additional thinking about what's going on in the Saturn system. There is a current school of thought that emerged after the end of the Cassini mission that um, things in the Saturn system are relatively young, that there is been uh, evolution, substantial evolution, including the formation of satellites and things in the last billion years or a few hundred uh, million years. Uh, now that's not by any stretch of the imagination uh, been a, a conclusive, uh, it can be concluded that's what has happened, but it's certainly a viable hypothesis. Uh, there's also the possibility that for instance, that uh, Titan, because of its further distance from the sun, sequestered a lot of methane and uh, uh, nitrogen ice on its surface when it first formed. And as the sun has slowly heated up over the ensuing billion years, you know, this, the, you all know probably about the right. early sun hypothesis that um, this um, surface layer uh, of, uh, of these volatile ices uh, uh, volatilized in the, only the last billion years or so and produced an atmosphere long after the, a period of late heavy bombardment may have ended. So. There are several different ways that you can end up with three worlds, basically the same density, more or less made of the same stuff, bulk, bulk composition, same size, whole nine yards. Yet each of those are very different than each other. I well, mean, doesn't, uh, sure. doesn't uh, what is it? Triton has an atmosphere too, doesn't it? And yes, Triton does have an atmosphere. As well as Pluto, of course, right? As, so. as Pluto and both their atmospheres are currently very thin. I mean, put things yeah. in perspective, the uh, surface pressure um, uh, on Titan is one and a half that of the Earth's atmospheric pressure. And the atmospheric density is six times the density of the Earth's atmospheric pressure at the surface. And in contrast, um, uh, the atmospheres of, um, of Pluto and uh, Triton, which they may vary fairly widely. And you, if you heard my talk last summer about I'm sorry, if you heard my talk uh, several years ago about uh, uh, Pluto, uh, we discussed the fact there could be a fairly substantial range of atmospheric pressures on time scales of hundreds of thousands or millions of years mm -hmm. on Pluto. But currently, the atmospheric pressure is very thin. It's a, around roughly 10 microbars, which is mm -hmm. one 100,000th the atmospheric pressure of the Earth today. Uh, and put that in perspective, the atmospheric pressure of the surface of Mars itself is is an order of 
roughly six um, millibars, which again shows it's a thousand times thicker than the atmospheres of, of uh, Pluto and, and, and uh, Triton. Um, but of course, it's six microbars is less than one one hundredth the atmospheric pressure of the Earth. Let's just put it this way. You probably will be using parachutes to break your landing on Triton or Pluto like you can on Mars. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Sure. Uh, were you, uh, Jeff, were you able to see the uh, chat questions? No, no, please ask questions in, uh, in um, <laughs> chat. So I'll, I see there's like 18 questions and please, those of you who always ask those questions, just, just read them to me and we can have a, a discussion about them. I, I had a question about the flight plan. You mentioned that it's missing or one of the proposed flight plans is missing the leading and trailing hemispheres. Are there specific features that are of interest that you would want to see or, or study further? Well, yes, for instance, the Calamari Chaos, which we just uh, use as the outro, uh, is located right smack along the uh, 270 degree longitude line. And we won't be able to fly very close to it uh, with the kinds of tours that the one I showed you represent. And likewise, the uh, young uh, impact feature of Will, which we'd like to get close enough, for instance, to get a good um, uh, uh, radar sounding of its uh, you know, ground penetrating radar sounding of its uh, subsurface. Also, we currently are not in a position really to <coughs> fly, <coughs> pardon me, uh, closely to it either. And, and effectively, we will not be able to use the radar to study it. And if we end up with these exclusion zones of the leading and trailing longitudes. Um, as I said, um, obviously, you know, spacecraft in orbit around. Um, Jupiter have historically been able to get close to those features because we did it with Galileo. It's just, I think it's uh, in the current nominal mission, you kind of can't have your cake and eat it. You can't get the, the widespread coverage where you can see much of the surface and basically more or less map out the, the uh, surface of exclusions of some lower resolution issues around the leading and trailing regions, you know, basically to simulate much of the results you have gotten from an out and out orbiter going around uh, Europa and then having the ability to do these close flybys of the uh, leading and trailing uh, longitudes. But maybe once we've satisfied the initial um, science uh, requirements that the uh, types of, of uh, orbital tours I showed you in that example uh, have been met, we can then go into orbits which permit us to fill in these gaps, such as the one for leading and trailing hemispheres. So Jeff, I have a innocent question I don't have an answer to because I could look it up in parallel, which I won't, um, which has to do with your, the impression I get then from your description is that Europe is tidally locked? Yes, all four Galilean satellites um, both have the same, you know, sub um, Jovian point more or less pointed directly at um, at Jupiter and right. they, uh, the inner three do not have um, circular orbits, they have uh, decidedly elliptical orbits because of this uh, two to one residence, you know, um, right. uh, you know, Jupiter, uh, um, Europa goes around Jupiter once uh, for exactly um, uh, half the uh, interval, uh, half the period as, um, as Io and uh, it goes around um, Jupiter exactly twice as uh, often as does Ganymede. So all three of those satellites are locked in these two to one residences. And, and so because of that, their orbits are forced out of circularity by the gravitational interactions amongst the moons. But then they themselves are in this very steep gravity gradient that is Jupiter. And so as they um, rise and fall in their elliptical orbits, um, the uh, distortion of uh, the tidal torque uh, imposed on their, their, their solid bodies uh, by Jupiter itself, then, is what's causing the tidal torque heating, frictional heating of the interiors, which uh, cause Io, in particular, you know, have amongst the most spectacular volcanism in the solar system, and keeps uh, Europa warm enough to have a subsurface ocean. And even in the case of uh, Ganymede, you know, Ganymede has a, a, a apparently a um, liquid metal core, which produces its own intrinsic magnetic field. Hmm. 
Well, that was the ex explanation I was looking forward to, to say why is there, why are there shadow zones in the leading and trailing hemispheres and that's why they're locked, so. Well, the leading and trailing hemispheres are shadow zones from the orbital tour is because uh, in order not to uh, fry the spacecraft too quickly with um, uh, Jupiter's radiation fields, which are surprisingly uh, disconnected, the, the really high ionizing radiation portion of the magnetosphere lies uh, in kind of a pancake shaped region um, that uh, uh, is approximately uh, about the uh, equator of of uh, Jupiter, uh, it's actually tilted by a, a few degrees, but uh, it's still close enough that if you put your spacecraft in an essentially uh, uh, equatorial orbit about Jupiter, you'll get a tremendous amount of radiation and you'll fry your electronics sooner than later. Yeah. In fact, that's the reason why we didn't put the spacecraft directly in orbit around um, uh, Europa because we figured the spacecraft would be toasted by the end of the year by the radiation. Mm. There was, there was that and one other tremendous advantage that occurred to us um, from uh, first the Magellan mission back in the 1980s and 90s and then by Juno itself is that if you have your spacecraft flying past the target uh, once every two weeks, uh, it spends, you know, maybe an hour or two close to the target collecting data, but then it has an entire two week period to relay all the data back to the ground. Whereas if had we gotten ourselves into an orbit around uh, uh, Europa, and this was a, con a emission concept which we studied very intensely in the first decade of, of the current century. We were faced with all sorts of problems with having basically data throughput to get the data, you know, off the spacecraft and back to the Earth in a way which uh, didn't cause serious degradation of it just due to data compression and things like that. So the elegant solution were these, uh, uh, where you actually orbit Jupiter itself, you have much of the time the spacecraft is away from the worst parts of the radiation field, so therefore it's not being, you know, fried. And you have, you know, plenty of time to um, empty your uh, solid state recorders back to the earth and, and send back, you know, uncompressed or losslessly compressed data to the, to the ground rather than having to do all kinds of onboard processing of all the kinds of artifacts and gotchas that could create and things like that. I have a question about the James Webb Space Telescope. It's okay. Supposedly it's it's able to, it's if it ever launches, it's gonna be able to image the plumes on Europa. I saw an article about that. It may help guide some of your research or? Well, of course, if they, uh, if the James Webb uh, uh, detects plumes and detects them unambiguously and more, more importantly can Give us a sense of where they are and are they are, are these eruptions uh, predictable? We will certainly use that information to plan flybys so that our instruments, like for instance the mass spectrometer and so on, uh, can fly through those plumes during an eruption, which will be the best way we can get a, a sampling of the material that's in, uh, that makes up the interior of uh, the ocean. So it's devoutly to be hoped that. The plumes are real and we can know enough about them to um, fly our spacecraft uh, through one or two of them uh, and collect the kinds of in situ information that you can you could only do by that process and do much for Europa what similar types of instrumentation did for the plumes uh, of Enceladus on uh, the Cassini mission. Yeah, and just a quick follow-up. So on the, uh, we had one speaker a couple of years ago that said, we, instead of going to Europa, we should go to Enceladus because the ionization uh, uh, situation around Saturn is such more benign than Jupiter. So it, was there any consideration of doing that instead? Well, uh, there is a lot of interest in going to um, Enceladus quite independently of whether it's a, quote, better place than um, in Europa. I'll make the argument that um, Europa's ocean probably has been there for billions of years. Um, and if people who hypothesize that the things that are happening in the Saturn system uh, are relatively uh, recent in the geological time, that means that uh, if life could form in the water pockets or, or a little water uh, ocean uh, in uh, Enceladus, it has had less time to do so. Uh, it probably, you know, Enceladus is a very small world. It's only about 
think it's 400 kilometers in diameter or something like that. Uh, and um, and for one thing, if you if if Europa had I'm sorry, if Enceladus has been erupting over the lifetime of the solar system as much as it's erupting currently, it basically erupted itself out of existence. So <laughs> there's something funny going on with uh, with Enceladus, and Enceladus is an, a fascinating world in its own right, and there are several ongoing studies right now to uh, see if we can't send spacecraft to Enceladus to further investigate the nature uh, and chemistry of its ocean. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if a mission to Enceladus um, is selected by NASA in the next 10 years to, to do just that. Well, we might be able to, if we can find more uh or generate more plutonium to be able to power the thing because to get out to Saturn you're going to need that. Well, it, interestingly, they we, we've been told, been briefed by some of uh, the people who develop uh, the solar panel systems, at least as far as the orbiters are concerned, you can conceivably even collect enough sunlight uh, Saturn space to drive some, at least the orbital operations. Now, if you send a spacecraft down to the surface, of either Europa or uh, or Enceladus, just because they have day night cycles, you you really can't use solar panels there, and you will have to use RTGs. But but NASA has, in the last several years, invested a lot of time and money, along with the Department of, of Energy, to make sure we have adequate supplies of plutonium two thirty eight to power the next generation RTGs. Uh, and so I anticipate we'll have sufficient power to, you know, use judiciously to. Um, to send landers to Europa, send spacecraft down at or near the surface of Enceladus and, and do other things like perhaps fly a, you know, a large dedicated mission to one of the ice giants, uh, that, which in this case I'm referring to uh, Uranus or Neptune, which have been grossly understudied, save for the Voyager 2 flybys. Mm -hmm. Yet, as you know, uh, uh, Uranus and Neptune's sized uh, and density objects or mass objects make up the uh, uh, most common uh, extrasolar planets. So, right. if you're interested in what are the most what's the typical extrasolar planet like, we probably should learn a little bit more about Uranus and Neptune. Yeah. Learn about our own first. Yeah, that would be nice. Well, it's a lot easier to get to ours than the other ones right now, at least. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, I recently read an article that said something about the fact that if we don't start having a, a program in place to be able to do the generation of, of fuel for the RTGs that we they won't be able to. Well, that was a serious concern at the beginning of the, of the decade we just ended. So back in 2011, we were worried about just that issue. Uh, but NASA took those concerns to heart. And I can tell you now that uh, we have a program in place to make adequate amounts of plutonium to support RTGs. Good. Okay. Well, that's encouraging. In fact, it's up in beautiful Hanford, where we just saw one of the the uh, 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 gravity telescopes was located. I'm sorry. Say that one again. Oh, it's in fact the the, the place where the plutonium is made is is Hanford, uh, yes. Washington. Yes. <laughs> right. Oh. Exactly. I don't Any see other questions uh, in the? Um, Trying to think. Uh, is there any um, any parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that you wish you could have covered? Oh, with the space. With well, yeah, we're doing a pretty good job because you know, mm -hmm. starting with the with the radar, we can see you know, centimeter to meter sized. Uh, we can both you know uh, 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 detect uh, emission as well as of course our own signals we we, we uh, transmit and then wait for the return signal. Uh, then there's kind of a gap between that and uh, and the uh, longest wavelength that the uh, near IR spectrometer can see. The near IR spectrometer probably sees up to 40 microns. I can't remember right off the top of my head exactly what its range is, but it's going to be on typical between 10 and 40 microns, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the near IR spectrometer operates from you know uh, red to about 4.5 microns. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a whole range of uh, filters um, in the camera and half the people uh, on this uh, in this club no doubt um, 
image of CCDs, you know perfectly well what the range of uh, wavelengths you, or, uh, CCDs are sensitive to out to around one micron. And then the UV spectrometer, and I'm not a UV person, I, I can't remember you know, what the actual UVA and UVB range is, uh, but that information is readily available on our website. Uh, now we don't have uh, uh, X-ray or gamma ray uh, spectrometers. I, they weren't seen to be particularly useful, although uh, uh, other instruments on the spacecraft which detect overall radiation and energetic, the energetic nature of, of, of uh, particles that should strike the spacecraft will probably allow a uh, reasonable uh, inference of those high energy environments. So I think we're doing a pretty good job. Well, it just seemed like there was a big gap in the microwave spectrum. Well, there is. I, I, you're right that, you know, nobody's looking at uh, you know, 100 microns or 200 microns or anything like that. Um, and historically, we have flown instruments. Well, for instance, uh, uh, Cassini had the Sears instrument, which could operate out in that, in that range. Um, and sure enough, we might be missing things uh, out in that range. Um, but the spacecrafts are a pretty instrument laden as it is. And, yeah. and uh, our dear friends at headquarters, you know, uh, accuse us of Christmas treeing our spacecraft have left our own devices. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I can, I'm, I can well appreciate the fact you've got X amount of mass you have to lift. And you right. can only put Y number of instruments on it, and that's it. You know, you don't get well, I served on the original science definition team for the various Europa mission concepts, and we told them that you know you, you that if you really had to boil it down, you can you could get by with just three instruments. That was a uh, IR spectrometer, a camera, and a radar sounder, mm -hmm. yeah. and everything else was kind of gravy. So, uh, given the range of instrument, instruments we do have on the spacecraft, we've got quite a bit of gravy already. Oh yeah. Now it's essential gravy. You know, anybody who's ever gone to uh, eat turkey without gravy knows it's pretty dry. <laughs> so, yeah. I had a question for you. I read in some article a while ago, and I think this was kind of like far, uh, far future thinking, but that somehow we would land something on Europa that would actually melt the ice and actually get down to the water itself. Uh, any any thoughts on that or? Oh, absolutely. In fact, there's yeah. a, a number of, of uh, preliminary studies which NASA uh, supports at various levels to, uh, to look at how do you get through the ice crust and into the ocean. So the next mission to the surface of Europa or the next mission to Europa after the um, orbiter will certainly be a, um, a surface lander, which will be something like the equivalent of a Viking lander and maybe want to have some limited uh, mobility, although it wouldn't range as far as the rope the Mars rovers do, which you might want to be able to creep up a few tens of meters onto the interesting spot from where you've landed. Uh, and um, NASA, well, I should say Congress, in particular, particular Congressman uh, who uh, lost his seat in 2018, um, uh, earmarked um, hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, develop a um, asked JPL to develop a very substantial uh, Europa lander mission concept, which was developed and it's very mature. And the reality is if that, you know, the problem is you'd be committing several billion dollars to send a, uh, a lander there now. And, and so NASA is trying to understand its priorities. I mean, the, uh, the present program of trying to do a Mars sample return mission is gonna be very expensive and it may turn up to kind of eat one's lunch in the same way that uh, uh, trying to get the James Webb uh, up and on station has eaten the lunch of a lot of other astrophysics missions. So uh, before we end up with a situation where we're overextended on our, our finances, we've, or I should say NASA has prudently uh, uh, held uh, its uh, powder dry on whether it wanted to proceed with the lander right this moment. I think uh, speaking just for myself, that there's probably a predisposition uh, uh, amongst NASA officials to um, to uh, confirm that we understand what it, it is that's most interesting about where we want to land on Europa and just what is the nature of that spot on Europa before you commit to a final uh, lander design and the selection of its instruments and how that lander uh, they have to uh, negotiate the surface. I mean, for instance, if if we uh, learn from Europa Clipper that there's this, you know, big green layer, you know, along the face of a sheer cliff, uh, 
you know, the lander design we have now would have a hard time landing on the sheer cliff face, right, to sample the big green layer. But if you knew the big green layer was there, well, you'd ask the engineers to figure out some way to, to, to get to it, wouldn't you? <laughs> I, I thought we've been told to attempt no landing there. Arthur Clark said that. <laughs> So far, we haven't heard from Hal or, or Dave Bowman yet, so no. we'll hold tight. Although you'll be interested to know that the monolith has become the official mascot of uh, the Europa Clipper mission, and and uh, several of the, uh, the members of the team have built uh, full-scale uh, monolith mo uh, mock-ups. And amongst other things, uh, a few uh, a couple of years ago, we were all asked to sign the monolith uh, using uh, uh, UV ink, so you can only see our signatures in UV light. As Dr. Mar is otherwise pristine black surface. That's awesome. <laughs> well, again, th this uh, the Clipper mission currently the way it's been mapped out is going to add a lot of detail visually to the to the surface um, measurements and morphology that you would li really like to know more about before you even send the lander that way, so sure. That's right, and I, I mean, I'm very confident that we will see very interesting things on the surface of Europa, and we will know exactly what kind of instruments to take down there and exactly how you get to that spot uh, uh, mm -hmm. from, from the Earth to the surface, mm -hmm. as to make sure that their instruments are safely uh, and, and effectively uh, uh, able to interrogate the local surface. So. Uh, and, you know, if you wanted to take a, sh a chance, you could probably build this, as I say, very mature design that, uh, that uh, JPL has already developed, but because it was a, no one really knows, I mean, for instance, the best resolution images of uh, Europa right now from Galileo are typically have resolutions of not much better than about 10 meters per pixel. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, 10 meters, that's a lot, you know. Uh, most of us live in houses which are not much more than you know 10 meters across so right. all manner of sin can hide it in 10 meter resolution images for instance you have no idea what the actual um, meter scale texture of the surface is and so you know we might be in for nasty surprises when we get down to the surface for instance the surface might be covered with uh you know ice blades or something and, and until mm -hmm. we know for sure what we're dealing with yeah and considering what a commitment of sources it is for NASA to build a several billion dollar lander, maybe it's prudent to make sure we know what we're doing before we go. Yes, no, don't want another Neil Armstrong moment. No, or and, and remember the the um, the uh, Viking landers were simply lucky because the yes. Viking orbiter imaging systems, you know, never saw those targets better than about twenty meters per pixel when they got down to the ground. Mm -hmm. The Viking lander cameras reveal there were all kinds of large boulders, you know, within a few tens of meters of the landing site that had the, had the uh, uh, lander come down on those boulders that would have broken the lander. So they exactly. were taking a shot in the dark. So that, they were lucky that both of them worked. Exactly. Yep. Well, come on, people. We've got another 15 minutes or at least we can ask questions. He's a valuable resource. Let's ask him. <laughs> Anybody get good pictures of Mars last uh, fall? Oh, I'm sure that they did. Between oh, I saw some beautiful Damon Peach takes some. He, apparently, he had access yeah. to like a a thirty inch uh, telescope in um, uh, in Australia, and he produced a few images which are just amazing. They like. Oh, yeah. You know, you can see things that are a few tens of kilometers across. They were spectacular. Yeah. You know, they well, look like distant images taken from a spacecraft. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sure Dan and a few other of our astro imagers are on board right now can attest to that. Yeah. Yeah, it was a beautiful apparition. In fact, I uh, uh, had the presence of mind to see that Orion's now selling a so-called Mars filter, which rejects green light. So unlike the old Ratkins, which you could use to see features but couldn't see atmospheric stuff, um, the little Mars filter, and uh, I do not work for the uh, Orion Corporation, so I'm not, <laughs> not hawking their stuff uh, out of any personal remuneration. It was very nice because you could see, you know, good contrast on the surface and you could also see uh, um, atmospheric stuff. It was really very pretty. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, yes, sir. If, if there was 
without a doubt, a plume coming out of whatever hole it was. Uh, South Pole. South Pole. How would you analyze it? I mean, what, what would you do? Well, the, uh, we have an instrument on the spacecraft, which is similar to an instrument that was flown on uh, uh, Cassini called a mass spectrometer. And a mass spectrometer uh, sucks in the rarefied uh, atoms and molecules that are make up the, uh, the plume material uh, and uh, is able to give you the atomic mass weight of the uh, individual uh, atoms and molecules. And of course, there's always some ambiguity, you know, because several different kinds of things can have the same atomic mass, right? Uh, or molecular mass, but the zeroth order, uh, you know, if you apply a little bit of common sense chemistry, you can usually pretty well infer uh, the um, elements and uh, compounds uh, that make up the, the plume material. Uh, and as a demonstration of how well that works, you can go to the Cassini uh, website and look what the mass spectrometer did for the, uh, the uh, uh, plumes of Enceladus. Okay. That's the principal instrument. There are other instruments that can collect, that detect dust. There's a so-called the SUDA instrument, which collects dust. And it can tell you something about dust uh, distribution, something about composition, things like that. Um, uh, depending upon the opacity of the plumes, you, know, you, can, you can examine uh, light transmissivity as well as reflectivity of plume material with the other uh, remote sensing instruments, just the same way you yeah. Look at those features with, uh, um, you know, from the Earth, various uh, instruments attached to either orbital platforms or, or ground-based platforms. I mean, really, they're, they're seeing, they think they're seeing evidence for plumes in the UV uh, from uh, both terrestrial and orbiter, orbiter, orbiting assets. Um, and so we have a UV spectrometer on uh, Europa Clipper, which would obviously get a ringside seat of a uh, what you could learn in the UV from looking at plume material, should we see it? So I, we have the ability to, to uh, interrogate the plumes fairly, uh, uh, fairly completely. I mean, the plumes, the, the possible detection of the plumes took place at a time uh, just before there was instrument selection or even before the proposals for writing uh, instrument proposals happened. So a number of groups proposed instruments that could interrogate the plume. So uh, the plume possible discovery was timely in that sense that we didn't end up with a spacecraft that uh, that we find out there are plumes after we had basically picked the instruments and we were scrambling to figure out how can they select the instruments to do the job. The instruments that were selected were selected in part to do that job. And how close to the surface of the moon are you planning on getting? Well, because people are interested in possible plume material, and for that matter, other surface materials are essentially knocked off the surface either by micrometeorites or more commonly by high energy particles striking the surface and doing something that's called sputtering. Um, there is a struggle between instruments like, for instance, the uh, mass spectrometer to fly very close to Europa, like 20 or 25 kil kilometers above the deck uh, at uh, closest approach. Uh, and the fields and all the other instruments, the, the, the um, uh, uh, remote sensing instruments, the radar, the cameras, all those instruments actually don't work very well. If you get closer than about 35 kilometers above the surface, they begin to have smear issues. The radar begins to have ambiguity in recognizing the uh, return pulses and things like that. And you actually degrade the signal if you get much closer than about 35 kilometers above the surface with, with the cameras, the spectrometers, and with the radar. So uh, the remote sensing instruments are ha were asked when the proposal call first went out to operate optimally at around 50 kilometers above the surface, out to several hundred or even several thousand kilometers above the surface, which they do. Mm -hmm. And then now that people, uh, this is, there are instruments which would benefit from being closer to the surface there may well be dedicated orbits in which those um, remote sensing instruments basically uh, have a sec are, are secondary to the um, the interest of collecting data with the uh, the in situ instruments like the like the mass spectrometer. And I'm sure if we see plumes uh, and we think we can fly through a plume, they will optimize the flyby to collect information with 
instruments like the mass spectrometer and people will you know be willing to take a hit on the degradation of the information that's collected at that moment on that particular flyby from the other instruments with the understanding of course we'll want to study the site from which the plumes emerge and we'll have other flybys um, which can be optimized to maximize the quality of information you collect with the remote sensing instruments. Right. Well, I had a question, quick question. How, what um, propellant are you be are you going to be using? Hydrazine. Hydrazine. Okay, so I thought. Well, it's yeah, it's it's one of the things that's, that doesn't ever seem to go bad. No. Does it ever go bad in the refrigerator? I mean, like for instance, um. Uh, the uh, Voyager spacecraft are still operating on the little bit of hydrogen left in their tanks. Hmm. And uh, New Horizons operates with the hydro you know, hydrogen left in its tanks. So they not only can they, you know, persist in tanks for in excess of a decade or several decades, they obviously, as long as the spacecraft has enough energy to keep the fuel lines warm so they don't freeze up, um, you know, it, uh, it makes an ideal pro propellant to use in the outer solar system. So hydrazine is kind of those bell safe propellants people like for just that purpose. Right. Now, someday in the future, when we send larger, more ambitious missions, you can imagine, especially as technology advances, that you could be able to store cryogenic fuels for some indefinitely long period of time. But we're not really in a place yet where we can fill a tank with liquid uh, hydrogen and expect to be much of it left by the time you arrive at the target a couple of years later. No, light, the light elements don't like to stay put. Right, so I'm, I'm not gonna say it's not um, technically possible to, uh, to overcome that, but it's a, it's a current technical challenge. Yeah. Well, even at, at um, at range where you're going to be at, um, what sort of electrical power is needed or can be collected? Oh, heck, I should know that. I mm -hmm. um, I do know how much power we use with New Horizons because I was <laughs> intimately involved in the, the development of the spacecraft. But what kind of power do we? It's on our website. Um, oh, is it? Okay. But it, you know, it has to be on order of a you know a kilowatt or so, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, the reason I mean, I New Horizons that. New Horizons uses. Uh, you know, you used 100, 200 watts. Um, and, you know, you had enough power, for instance, to power the uh, ground penetrating radar. And that's not trivial. No. Wikipedia um, says I, 600 watts. Uh, Again? Wikipedia says 600 watts, but okay. Wikipedia, so. Yeah, that's probably I had a question. Was, sorry, uh, just um, someone asked a question earlier. I want to ask it on, on his behalf, and that's... Um, is there something about the poles that's attracting interest? Um, I mean, you might have addressed it. I just well, the poles are interesting because, uh, for instance, there are um, this theoretical argument: the ice should be thicker at the poles than at the equator. I mean, um, uh, the Galilean satellites have almost no orbital inclination; they basically have no seasons. So, you know, over uh, some period of time, over a geological period of time, it's colder at the poles, and thus you expect the ice to be thicker. But then that poses a problem uh, that these thicker ice poles then should want to migrate towards the equator. So there may be all kinds of interesting stuff going on with this war between uh, ice thickening at the poles and the uh, tendency for thick ice layers to want to move towards the equator. Um, and we learned from our uh, flybys uh, with the Galileo that there seems to be um, things we saw at the poles, although that might just be a sampling uh, um, sampling bias that was going on that we didn't see elsewhere um, as much on uh, other parts of Europa, for instance, I recall that we took some very uh, handful of images very close to the North Pole with Galileo, which we saw a lot of uh, of smooth, very smooth, you know, uh, surfaces like uh, like like flooded ice trays um, uh, interspaced between the ridges uh, at the North Pole, which was uh, a much less less commonly seen uh, landform type uh, closer to the equator, and so on. So, you know, most worlds often have uh, latitudinal variations. You know, um, 
that's of course especially true of worlds that have their spin axis tilted for obvious reasons. Um, but it seems to also be true even for worlds which don't necessarily have a lot of um, obliquity or axial tilt. Um, and so obviously we're going to look at the, a range of latitudes to make sure we're not missing something. I mean, part of the mission is in fact a comprehensive survey of, of Europa's surface, just as if it were an orbiter. And we're going to, at least in the nominal mission, come as close as we can to basically mapping out the entire surface of Europa at good resolution. A follow-up question. Is the tendency of ice to go to the equator a centrifugal effect with rotational motion? What, what would cause that? That and also just the difference in, in uh, both density of the ice versus the water and um, and the mechanical, uh, but the centrifugal force uh, as much as any is playing a role in in uh, that uh, that process. Um, I think the original paper was done by Dave Stevenson and a colleague way back in the 1980s. I suspect you'll find um, some of those citations in a, if you go to Wikipedia, for instance, to look up Europa, it's probably list that. So I'm, I'm trying to remember when you brought up the uh, the uh, the darker features on the surface, um, the mechanisms for for um, that sort of deposits to be formed. Well, that's a good question. Uh, one po possibility is you simply have uh, non you have water erupting on the surface that's full of other compounds, and as the water uh, sublimates away, the uh, dried out compounds of say whatever the ocean's made of end up on the surface. Um, we also don't know how much of the uh, uh, ice crust itself, you know, that, uh, you know, entrains uh, and even concentrates uh, various types of, of uh, non-ice materials and, and that uh, those non-ice materials are exposed on the surface. We also could be deceiving ourselves about how much, uh, there may be a lot more uh, non-ice material available right at the surface than we think because much of the surface could simply be frosted and look like it's mostly made of pure ice. But in fact, if you went down there with an ice scraper and scraped off a few centimeters or a meter, you'd find that in fact there's uh, non-trivial concentrations of, uh, of non-ice residual uh, right near the surface. So all sorts of possibilities. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, freezing and thawing cycles, um, I'm sure, you know, we probably don't get so much thawing. <laughs> when we get these, we get freezing because stuff probably comes to the surface and freezes. Yeah. Uh, and 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 again, you know, you also have different layers. It's possible you had different layers in the ice crust that remain liquid, even though they are otherwise surrounded by um, by frozen ice, just because there might be higher uh, concentrations of salts in them, and just the same way we you know salt. Mm -hmm. depresses the melting point of, uh, of ice. You can imagine that brine pockets trapped in the ice of, or the, the ice around it is much less briny. And also um, uh, there is a, a phenomenon where um, material can become liquid uh, if it has the right concentrations of, of salty material as a function of the, of the pressure which it's under. So you could have a a pressure melting as material moves towards the surface and things like that. So there's lots of uh, mechanisms which are physically possible, which could result in uh, liquid pockets uh, in the near ice crust above, you know, simply right setting perched above the ocean proper. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm not sure why this question came up again. Uh, it's, I guess, uh, was thought that this hadn't been answered before. I think we did, but the repeat question was, was that leading and trailing hemispheres and why we would want to look at those in more detail? Well, because they're not being looked at or won't be able right. to- Right, and, and we know from uh, from, Boy from Galileo, there's actually at least two things I know of yeah. at the, uh, are more or less aligned at the, uh, the 270 degree longitude line, which is the, uh, center of the uh, trailing hemisphere, which I like to see. I like to look at the uh, culinary chaos more closely, uh, which was, well, as I say, was the uh, area we saw in the uh, backup slides, as well as this, is this crater Puil, which, uh, which is amongst the largest and most recent craters uh, uh, on, uh, on Europa. And, and so um, uh, 
personally, I hope we figure we 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 figure out a way to to examine those locations. Um, you know, hope springs eternal. We'll see what we can do in the uh, in the extended mission. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll come right up on nine o'clock now. I did I did leave us ample time afterward here in case we ran late. Um, don't see very many people with questions. I see a hand. Nathaniel, are you asking a question? Is your hand up? Uh, well, Nathaniel, yes. Uh, no, I already asked my question. Oh, your hand has come down. My okay. compliments on the man cave there, a nice garage. And oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, thanks for the talk. It was really living nice. Living in the Bay Area, of course, as you know, uh, you can't afford a big house, at least not on government uh, salaries, you can't. And so this was a, a standalone uh, garage, which I turned into um, into my study. So you can see that. Uh, oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a busy place. Yeah, and of course, I normally didn't expect uh, the, it to become a, as a, um, a public scene as it has become. But of course, in a very short notice, we had to vacate our offices. Uh, this <laughs> became my workspace. Um, yeah. In the meantime, we finally got around to um, uh, furnishing a, a, a new guest room. So I, I could go in there, but it was colder in there. And yeah. um, and I think the studies more interesting looking anyway. So Yes. I admire anyone who still has a turntable. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so my age, I got that turntable uh, when I was a kid in the army back in the 1970s, and yeah. it still works. I, I still have mine from high school, which is a while ago. <laughs> well, I have all these darn LPs, so right? I even occasionally play one of them, so you never know. Okay, folks, well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. I hope you'll invite me back sometime. There's the other three Galilean satellites. I'm happy to give you a spiel on them as well. The uh, European uh, Space Agency is flying a mission to uh, Ganymede, and I'll be happy to talk about it. And let's not forget Io and Callisto. Uh, I've uh, done um, uh, research on both those uh, targets and be happy to chat about them whenever. So. Well, there, there's one comment from Marnie. It's a uh, basically uh, comments, fascinating mission. We'll look forward to our talk on results in about 10 years. Okay, let's hope we're all still around to talk about it. <laughs> That'd be good, yeah. But while you're at it here, we still got you. Um, I was going to ask about um, uh, the uh, New Horizons while, while we got a chance. Okay. Where are we headed? Well, we are, uh, uh, as of next uh, month, we're going to be at 50 AU. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been looking uh, at the sky ahead of us, uh, both with um, uh, Hubble and ground-based very large you know, Subaru uh, um, telescopes and things like that. And we have found a few more objects, in including things which we didn't think um, parts of uh, the outer solar system, we didn't anticipate seeing things. And there was a, the idea that there was a KBO cliff out at about 40, 45 AU, and there wasn't much beyond that, but it appears that we're beginning to see things, mm -hmm. you know, at the 60 AU-ish uh, range, and we haven't yet seen anything we can actually, you know, do another close flyby of, although mm -hmm. we hope we'll find something, and we have the resources on the spacecraft to do that uh, kind of uh, uh, flyby, but it has to be... Uh, close enough to our current nominal trajectory that with the amount of fuel we still have on board the spacecraft, we could burn onto the target. Uh, Absolutely. You know, so I think realistically, there's probably only a few percent chance we'll actually hit something like or get to something like that. But you know, a few percent is better than 0%. And, and we are out there and we are looking. So stay tuned. Yeah, well, the on the you're, you're talking about the end of the KBO. Well, you don't really know where it is yet. That's right. And, and it's interesting that once you start uh, using, you know, serious resources to, to, um, to look out there, that uh, stuff begins to show up that you didn't realize was there. Yeah. And now the, the, all the, the other notion is, is that the Oort cloud kind of begins at about 2000. Well, 2000 AU, uh, we, we probably will not be operational 2000 AU. Oh, no, I understand that. I'm just saying that it seemed like there's this big gulf of nothing out there between 60 and... Yeah, you know, there's... Uh, that's just um, because we can't see it. There's a mission concept, which is getting a lot of publicity, uh, called the Interstellar Probe. And you can Google that and, and mm -hmm. read all about it. It's being, uh, studies being led by Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, 
you know, out in uh, Columbia, Maryland. Um, and that would be a mission in which they would launch uh, at a very high velocity where it would knock off, you know, you know 10 AU a, um, a year. And, uh, and it would be planned to do fly it by some of the substantially more distant, you know, KBO uh, dwarf planets. But its main objective is just to get way the heck out away from the, uh, the sun and see what the world looks like at 500 AU. Yeah. So their plan is to get to 500 AU in 50 years. Oh. Uh, it's an ambitious program. I, I'd be curious to see ultimately NASA signs up for the, the money to do it. I mean, but it, 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 uh, there's nothing technologically, there's nothing about it that can't be done. This requires, as always, the will to do so. For all line from Dr. Strangelove. Um, yeah. So, um, as I say, uh, there's a lot of interesting ideas floating around. I, um, and if people interested in the interstellar, the interstellar mission, or I invite you to go look at their website. Uh, it would be interesting to go see some of these other worlds that are, you know, 100 AU away from the, the sun that are this, almost the size of Pluto and see what the heck is going on with them, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a speculation about, uh, you're familiar with Crate's uh, sun grazers, right? Say again? The Crate's sun grazers, comets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Go very close to the sun, but then their uh, farthest extent is like a couple hundred AU out. And so... You know, I, I should go look and see how they plan to get their um, get their spacecraft out at you know 500 AU in 50 years. They may, in fact, be doing something like that. They fly to Jupiter kill the velocity of it fall towards the sun and use that to slingshot it out at some ridiculous, you know, 10 AU a year speed or something like that. Um, yeah. I, I, or else I suspect they might be using a uh, nuclear electric propulsion where you load up the thing with a bunch of RTGs and, uh, and ion uh, engines and you just turn them on and let them, you know, power on for, you know, several years and get your, get your velocity up to, you know, 10 AU a year. Yeah. I have a question. Is there any plans to try to visit one of these uh, interstellar uh, visitors like uh, Muamua? Is well, there any projects? That's really hard to do because you don't know about yeah. them until they're basically on their way out usually. Right. And yeah. so you'd have to have resources maybe stationed, you know, you know, uh, in orbits out by uh, Mars or something. Uh, close enough with, you know, substantial Delta V that you could somehow find a target like that, recognize it, have, um, you know, um, a, a uh, asset uh, on orbit that you could, um, you know, uh, fire up and send uh, for a, a fast flyby of such a target. Um, it's probably a hard thing to convince uh, governments to spend much money on just because it's, it's so, you know, the, the, it'd be extremely expensive and the uh, chance of success is relatively small. Yeah. Well, you're almost better off just having, you know, uh, really big telescopes uh, in orbit, presumably, that can, you know, when you detect something like that, you interrogate them from a distance. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, if we can't even build another uh, uh, version or next generation air receivable, what else are you? <laughs> you know, we could build one. Just somebody has to decide to do it, right? Yes. I mean, obviously, we could build it in 1960. You can build it in 2020. Yeah. In fact, as you know, the, the uh, PRC, the Chinese have built a, a bigger um, uh, Arecibo-like dish than Arecibo was, although I understand it doesn't have quite the capability of Arecibo. Oh, yeah, it's that. a receive only. It doesn't have a transmitter. Right. And clear, in fact, uh, there's been a, a lot of discussion about replacing Arecibo and one of the uh, possible clients you're interested in rebuilding Arecibo is the Space Force. Yes. Uh, in part because the Space Force wants the ability to see what's actually in orbit around the moon uh, mm -hmm. because it's military and militaries are by definition um, uh, conservative and suspicious. Otherwise they wouldn't really be a military, would they? Uh, and, um, and also because you use it for planetary defense so from uh, natural objects. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, I, so it, it wouldn't surprise, and indeed, you know, if they're going to throw more money than, you know, vast amounts of money at the at the space force, the space force budgets anything like the rest of the of the uh, various branches of the of the Department of Defense, they could very rapidly end up with more money than NASA has, um, 
And if they have you know, billions of dollars to throw around, then you know, more power to them. They want to be used to build a next generation era CBO. Well, I can imagine less useful things for them to spend their money on. Oh, sure. Okay, well, it looks like we're about done, guys, unless somebody has some questions. Come on. Thanks for everything. Sure, okay. my pleasure. Right. Okay, well, I think we're going to cut you loose here, Jeff. All right, well, until next time, folks, thanks for inviting me. Okay, well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Stay safe. My pleasure, Peace. likewise. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye, guys. We'll see you next month.